Welcome to AUSA's first coffee series of 2023, featuring the Chief of Staff of the U.S. Army. Thank you for being here. My name is Alex Brody. I am the Director of Meetings here at the Association of the United States Army, and it is great to welcome everyone back for this in-person annual event. I would first like to thank our four-star sponsors, Leonardo DRS, General Dynamics, and our two-star sponsor, Northrop Grumman, for their support of the coffee series. We simply cannot do this without your support, and we do appreciate it. Let's give our sponsors a big round of applause. And with that, my two minutes of fame are up, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce the President and CEO for the Association of the United States Army. Please put your hands together for General Bob Brown. <laughs> I don't know about that. Forcing them to recognize you there, but uh, hey, great to see you. What a great way to start 2023 uh, with the 40th Chief of Staff of the Army and, and quite honestly, the right leader at the right time. And we're so glad, uh, Jimmy, that you're in, in this role. So I'll start off with some uh, questions and so forth, but I want you to, to be ready. Uh, we will uh, save plenty of time uh, for questions from, from folks out there. I want to welcome so many senior leaders here. It's great to see you. And then our industry leaders, uh, congressional staffers, thanks for being here and, and for all you do. Uh, we know it's so key for our soldiers and, and their success in the future. And so uh, let's get right into it, Jim. And uh, again, thanks for being here. You just, just got back from kind of a, a world tour of 11 countries. You want to start off kind of a a summary on that that trip? Yeah, I would. And, and thanks, Bob. And uh, it's good to see so many friends here. I see a lot of our allies and partners, which yeah. is uh, really important. And uh, you know, what's interesting is when your West Point classmate is sponsoring uh, the event and your West Point classmate is interviewing you, you know, I'm, I'm hoping they I kind of, you know, hopefully we'll see how it goes. But anyways. No, we but, have some tough questions. Yeah, tough so, questions. Uh, questions know. are coming. I'm, I'm ready. Uh, you know, this is kind of not my first rodeo. And, and so it's great to be here. But what, what Bob says is absolutely true. Uh, had a chance to go see what our troops are doing in the Middle East uh, and, and in Eastern Europe. And so we, we were in, um, uh, certainly in, we were in Kuwait, we were in Iraq, uh, we were in Qatar, we went through Jordan, uh, went over to uh, Israel, and then we were in Greece. We were in Romania, Poland, Germany, uh, Finland, and Sweden. That was all in 10 days. And so we, we had a chance. And, and what I would tell you, though, is I, I just so impressed what the American soldier uh, is doing in conjunction with our allies and partners who are working uh, together very, very closely. And I think, you know, having traveled, you know, extensively in Europe over the years, uh, you know, a couple of years back, no one could imagine uh, that there would be an unprovoked attack on Ukraine. It just it was unimaginable. It wasn't even discussions. And as you talk to fellow chiefs, especially army chiefs, the question was always, well, it's very difficult to get the resources we need because no one can imagine having a ground war or a special military operation or whatever, however you want to describe it, uh, in Europe. But it, it is a very intense uh, war. I, I would argue it's the you know, largest uh, you know, combat, a large-scale combat operation we've seen since uh, World War II in Europe, and uh, a lot of innocents are being hurt. And you know, and again, what I see when I travel to to all these countries, and I've been in the Baltics, and um, uh, is they really appreciate uh, our, our soldiers, and our soldiers are, are making a difference. Um, they they are reassuring, and they are deterring, and they are supporting, and they are training, and uh, you know I just could not be more proud of what they're doing uh, to help uh, really maintain the security uh, of Europe. And I, I think what the globe, as I talk to many of my counterparts around the world, a regional conflict has global implications. And I was speaking to, you know, a few, a few months back to uh, the chief of staff of the Bangladesh Army. And you would think, well, how would that affect them? And, uh, you know, because of economic reasons, they get a lot of their grain from Ukraine, you know. And so this is affecting everyone. And I think the lessons learned for others that may think about doing unprovoked attacks is this is going to affect your country. It's going to affect your, your, your economy. And, you know, if the world stands together, uh, I think we're in a much better position to deter or prevent any of these things happening uh, in the future. Well, uh, let's, let's uh, look at 
Ukraine a little a little closer, Chief, if you would. On just uh, I had the opportunity to travel over to Europe last month as well, and I was amazed at all the Army is doing. Can you dig into a little bit more what our soldiers are doing over there? I, I was just found it incredible, much more than I heard or thought. Yeah. Yeah, well, there's a lot of, you know, discussion on what's what's happening in Ukraine and what's happened over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, really, since 2014, there's been extensive training uh, being done. You know, mm -hmm. the National Guard has, has a relationship that goes on for uh, many, many years and, uh, you know, certainly have been instrumental in that relationship. Uh, but there's been a, a lot of training and having the capability uh, in Europe to do to train at the large scale uh, level, you know, talking to Chris Cavoli and, and you know, kind of going back, I, we had done a lot more training of 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 their units than even I imagined mm -hmm. as far as mm -hmm. uh, what happened. But I, I think the lessons that we're learning um, are, are, are good insights to the way ahead. We're using the lessons learned to kind of grade our transformational, mm -hmm. um, you know, where, where we're going transformational wise, and, and taking a look at our priorities and what works and what doesn't work. And you know, I argue. Mm -hmm that every 40 years, the Army transforms itself. It, it did it in 1940 with General Marshall. And what General Marshall said, which you know is, is I think very interesting today, is you know in 1940, before World War II, he said, you know, when I had the time, uh, I didn't have the resources. Mm. And then when I got the resources, I didn't have the time. And we're seeing that play out with many of our uh, uh, colleagues or allies and partners is they've, they've got the money now, and is the industrial base ready with their organic industrial base, is our industrial base ready to produce um, the, the weapon systems and ammunition uh, at the time they need to do? And then you, you take a look at the next big transformation that the Army had, and many of you were involved in this, especially some of the, um, the general, general men and general women with gray or hair, but, you know, uh, and... and, and <laughs> Dave House, no, 1980s. I mean, you know, think about it. You know, we, we, you know, most of the the doctrine uh, that we use, the organizations, the tr how we train, and you know, the big five weapon systems are all late 70s, early 80s that we've incrementally improved over the years. And you know, some would argue you would really um, in, uh, instructed or, or uh, gave insight to the to the generals who were sitting in our position. 1973 was the Arab-Israeli War. They took a look at that coming out of Vietnam, took a look at that conflict, and then graded what they needed to have. And I think out of that, a lot of the airland battle came out of that. You know, the Big Five came out of that, and a lot of the other systems that are the world's greatest systems that we use today. And so we find ourselves in uh, 2023. And we're taking a look at coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan, and, and we recognize you know, the, the national uh, security environment, and we need to be ready for large-scale combat operations. And we need to be very lethal in order to deter any that want to do that. So you know, when I take a look at what is going on in Ukraine, it's very instructive. Um, you know, we have the world's greatest army, and I saw the Sergeant Major of the Army uh, daily out there, because we have the world's greatest NCOs. And we say that, but it's proven in places like Russia. You know, a lot of people will come to me and they said, hey, wait a minute, you know, the Russians, um, you know, had problems, you know, with, with armor. You know, McConville, you don't need armor anymore in the army. And I would argue, uh, you don't need armor unless you want to win. And, 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 I, and, and I mean that, you know, because <laughs> as we go through a lot of, you know, lessons are being learned, learned as we work our way through it. You know, initially, our, uh, the Ukrainians were very effective with javelins and stingers and kind of in a complex terrain defense and, and, and were able to stop what was going on. But as you watch uh, the, 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 the conflict unfold, what, what is making a difference? <clears throat> Fires, you know, triple sevens. And you see the usage rate of ammunition is, is just really unbelievable, you know, almost, we, we have to take a look at, hey, if we're gonna get in a conflict, how much ammunition do we actually need to pursue this? And then, and then we see high Mars, a game changer. You know, people say that's long range fires. That is not what we consider long range fires uh, in the United States Army. And if you look at our portfolio with hypersonics and mid range capability, and you take a look at the prison strike missile, which is gonna ride on high Mars, I would argue those are going to be very effective in, in, in a future 
uh, conflict because what we're finding uh, is, you know, the, the and again, it's it, it's certainly not at the level that we think we could prosecute. Is I, I've often talked about um, speed, range, and this this concept of convergence. And I would argue it, it, it's playing out in a lot of ways. And the, and the Ukrainians have been very um, innovative on how do you locate targets and how do you bring precision fires at range at, 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 in a timely manner? That to me is, you know, and then you start to think about, well, you could imagine, you know, as we look at it, what if you were able to identify, you know, to extreme ranges where all the command posts were, where all the logistics were, and where all, you know, maybe, um, you know, airfields or any key infrastructures where you had the ability to um, readily attack them. That would change the way we do um, battle in the future. And so when we look at what we're doing, um, we, we see that as, as very important. You know, if you take a look at, you know, the idea of multi-domain operations. We've come out with a, you know, a new concept and it's out there and we are asking, it's probably not perfect. And for those who have studied, you know, take a look at it, give us feedback. We, we love feedback in the army. You know, we, we like people to give us feedback. It's very helpful. But, you know, when we, when we take a look at multi-domain operations, um, it, you know, airland battle, multi-domain operations, we're seeing that play out in Ukraine. They are contesting in the sea, they've sunk ships, you know? So the future, you know, ship sinking, anti-ship capability, especially if you're in a maritime environment where there's a potential for amphibious type landings, anti-ship is gonna be incredibly important. We're gonna be contested on the sea. If you take a look at what's going on in the air, they are contested in the air on both sides. You know, what are people asking for? Air and missile defense, air and missile defense, air and missile defense. And, you know, when you take a look at um, unmanned aerial systems, lethal drones or reconnaissance drones, they're all over the battlefield. We're going to have to deal uh, with, with that problem set, you know, as they come. And some will come back to us and say, well, you know, we don't need ground forces or we don't need, you know, they weren't very effective with armor or this. I would argue that you have to do combined arms and no system alone is going to be effective. If you send Apaches in by themselves, mm -hmm. And, you know, we saw that at the, at the beginning of OIF, you, you don't want to present uh, an adversary, uh, just one dilemma, if you will. You want to, you, you want to, you know, because you, you, you want to throw a bunch of balls at their heads so they don't know which one's a curve, which ones, and then they have to try to figure it out. And so all these lessons uh, are, are being learned in Ukraine and, and, you know, the Ukrainians are, are, are doing a great job. So all this is kind of coming together. The Army is, is certainly, with our allies and partners, we're providing critical uh, weapon systems that they are requested. We're providing critical, critical ammunition that they're requested. There's a lot of training. There's a lot of support. And, you know, it's not just how to operate the system. It's how to maintain the system and how to uh, work all those things. So uh, it, it is a very significant team effort uh, to help the Ukrainians uh, defend their country. You know, uh, look back about six years ago, and the Army I think, made a great decision prioritizing modernization in those six areas. It sounds like what's happened is that's been validated uh, really across the board from what's happening in Ukraine. Well, I, th I think so. You know, again, you know, we want to, you know, don't fall in love with the plan, if you will. Yeah. But I mean, we need to, you know, we need to keep uh, wire brushing those systems. But by being, you know, one thing I've learned and, you know, I'm on my ninth year straight, straight in the Pentagon, you know, 13 Ooh. years total. God bless me. No, I mean, but, you know, uh, but, but having said that, you know, and I let industry grade us, but being consistent and persistent, yeah. it takes time. You know, we just turned on the integrated personnel and pay system yesterday. It hasn't blown up too bad. We're waiting on that. But I mean, you know, but we were if, joking. You might have a no pay due. In yeah, I know. I'm getting paid as a lieutenant this month, but I, but, you know, <laughs> I don't mean to be, but if you're going to, some of these are hard problem sets. You know, so the you know, if say for the first time we'll have all three components on on one system, which allows you to do a whole bunch of things. You know, we, we can start managing people by their knowledge, skills, behavior, and preferences, and you can move from an industrial age personnel management system to a 21st century talent management system. And oh, by the way, if you know, and many of you are working with 
um, you know, our, our younger folks is they want us to compete for their talent. And so we'll be in a much better place to get the right people in the right place at the right time. But all these things are hard. If it was easy, it would have been done a long time ago. And, you know, all these programs um, are challenging and, you know, we just have to stay with them. And, and, and what we're seeing, and this is kind of thanks to industry is, uh, you know, we're building, you know, long range hypersonic, you know, missile system in about four years, which is pretty impressive. Uh, you know, mid-range capability, you know, scheduled to have the end of 23. Um, you know, PRISM is coming in, end of 23. I mean, right now, you know, I've talked about this, and I'm trying to keep momentum going is, you know, 24 systems in the hands of soldiers in, in 23. And, you know, some will, you know, not be exactly that. I mean, you, you, you'd like it be the perfect, but that's pretty incredible yeah. uh, to be able to get that. And it, it is, it is transformational. And a lot of things that we're doing, uh, people need to stay with. I, I'll give you an example, you know, IVAS, the Integrated Visual Augmentation System. Uh, I think that is one of the most transformational things we're doing. It's not quite where we need it yet, but if you take a look at um, the enhanced night vision goggle Bravo, which is, 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 is incredible goggles, and it, it, you know, we see, you know, for those of you know, been around for a long time, you know, that remember flying full face goggles when you couldn't see and you, you flew around scared for hours at a time and had no idea why the you know, helicopter still flew when you did it. A lot of people have done that, have done that. Some of the systems are not completely ready for prime time, but we should not give up on them because what's going to happen is it's going to be transformational uh, when we get that system. So, you know, I use, you know, some of you heard me talk before, I talk about phones, you know, not that I'm into the phone business, but you know, the idea of how we incrementally improved phones over the years. And many of us were very happy with Blackberries because we could talk on it and we could do email. But then all of a sudden, you know, we had smartphones come in and you see how we use smartphones. It was transformational. Mm -hmm. I would argue it's the same thing, you know, looking at the enhanced night vision goggles with Bravos, they're very good for what our troops need to do. But eventually, if we stay consistent and persistent with, with IVAS, we keep our soldiers and innovate and evolve, that will come to a point where we'll wonder how we ever did business before. It'll be major, it won't be big, it'll be smaller, it'll be miniaturized, but it's gonna take some time. But we have to be, I would argue, in the leading edge of technology. We have to be lethal. We have to give our soldiers the absolute best gear. So when we go into a conflict, um, they have an advantage. Yeah, no doubt. And, uh, you know, it, it sounds like you feel pretty confident. 24 uh, items delivered in 23 with the modernization program. It always you always hear. Yeah, Mr. 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 Bush, the Mr. Bush. Mr. Bush has promised me some. Is Doug here? No, <laughs> he's not here. No, but no, I mean, here's the thing. You know, uh, we're, 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 it, when I say it, it's not, that does not mean that every system is for, but it's in the hands of soldiers. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and what we find is get in the hands of soldiers, and then what we're going to do with these systems is just what we did you know, with the Apache or the Abrams tank, we've incrementally improved it mm -hmm. over the years. I mean, you take a lot of these, look at systems and someone, you know, I know a little about Apaches, but you know, you know, the, the AH-64 ALF is not the same as the Echo model version six. I mean, it's just, I mean, it may look a lot alike. Mm -hmm. It's got a mm -hmm. big fan, a little fan on the side and get some things on the side of it, but it is not, same thing with the Abrams tank. You know, it, it may look like, you know, the old M1, but it's not, mm -hmm. it is, it is, what we're trying to do is do, do the next leap. You know, as we take a look at future vertical lift, mm -hmm. and we take mm -hmm. a look at some of these systems, um, you know, we're trying to transform these systems so they go a lot faster, a lot mm -hmm. further. And then we take advantage of convergence. And, and quite frankly, again, that is the secret sauce of how do we um, get these systems mm -hmm. into the right place at the right time mm -hmm. at the speed of, of relevance and combat. And that is hard to do. Those have, you know, have, have you know, fired artillery, or, or used lethal effects, or done long range precision target. It does no good to have systems that go very far and very fast if you can't get them on the target very far and very fast. Mm -hmm. so. uh, well, let's uh, shift. You know, we all know that the Army doesn't man equipment, it equips soldiers and people, one of your priorities. Uh, all the services are facing these recruiting challenges right now. It seems like you know, just as you look back, one of the most difficult times I, I certainly, many of us can remember. Yeah. What, what, are you, uh, what are your efforts there in recruiting? Yeah, I, I think we're in a war for talent. 
and um, you know it's it's a war that we have to win, and you know we need everybody's help, everybody's help uh, to help us inspire young men and women uh, to serve the nation. We we need to call the service, and not just to the army, not just to the military, but you know to the police forces, to the medical corps, to um, teachers. You know we we need people. Uh, to go into institutions that that make this country mm -hmm. great, mm -hmm. and uh, we want to do that. Now, where the Army sits right now, we we had a very challenging year last last year. Quite frankly, we didn't make recruiting. Uh, interesting enough, retention is at a historical high. Hmm. Which, and again, I don't take that for granted. You know, and as we talk to commanders and sergeant majors, is we got to continue. The, you know, we can't take that on our laurels because that's extremely important. And even this year, the retention mission that we're put on command is, is extremely high. You know, we were like 105% last year. I'm like, well, we want to be much higher. The number we would ask for this year, we're, we're exceeding well above where even where we were last year because we got to man the army. And you know, what we're finding, and there's a lot of reasons why you know, some would say people you know, don't, don't, don't want to join the military. And, and quite frankly, if it's anything political, I won't comment on it. I'm staying right down, right down the middle. I'm staying out of that. I'm not, I'm not you know, just right down. But, but here's what we do know when I talk to recruiters. We have a lot of young men and women that want to serve. And they can't pass the academic requirements or they can't pass the physical requirements. And what we're not willing to do, at least with this chief and the secretary is with me, is we don't want to lower standards. Uh, we think that quality is more important than quantity. So what we're doing, what we're willing to do is we're willing to invest in young men and women. And we've set up a, what we call a future soldiers prep course at Fort Jackson. And we're getting ready to stand one up at Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. And we, and if it keeps going the way it's going, you know, we'll probably go to Leonardwood and we'll, we'll probably go to Sill. But what we're finding is, you know, whether it's COVID or whatever is going on, young men and women can't pass the ASVAB, the, 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 the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. Kind of, you know, for those that aren't familiar with it, it's, it's kind of like an SAT um, for the Army. They just can't pass it. And some of these are, you know, it, it, it's, it's harder for people today to pass it than, than uh, it was before. We did a, um, a pilot at a, a major university because someone asked, when I was at G1, they said, hey, um, we ought to have all the uh, ROTC cadets take the ASVAB. So, well, we go, let's just check that. And 50% passed. Um, and, and this was at, I won't say what the, where the university was, but it's a fairly significant university. Uh, so we might have to take a look at how we do that, but we're not willing to do that right now. So, mm -hmm. it, it, you know, at the preps course, they are learning, you know, how to do math. And if you've seen some of the pictures, they learn how to do fractions and they learn to do math. Uh, and you know, some you know, I, I took um, media down there, and they asked me, "Well, you're just teaching the test." I said, "Well, well, we're, we're teaching them. Uh, that, that's probably true. It's like some of you may have sent your kids to a um, SAT prep course. Maybe, maybe this is similar. Uh, but the other thing that what the what the, um, the the young recruits said was they were getting a lot more out of the math. They were getting discipline. They were getting standards." You know, because they, you know, it's basically a developmental course. There's no, it's not screaming, yelling. There's no, you know, kind of those type things that maybe some of the older folks are familiar with. What basic training? It's pure developmental. <clears throat> and what we're finding, and and this is where I think there's some secret sauce, and we've, we've put about three thousand uh, young men and women through this course, and we got about a ninety-five percent success rate. Either they're improving their scores, or they're losing body fat. To be able to do that and the other interesting thing that i've found is asking them is the, the young men and women that have been through this course were come in as what we would call category fours they, they still meet the minimum standards for the military but they're not we can only have four percent of those categories and so we really want to get them up and you would think that they may not do very well because they're in the bottom category after they're going through this course many mm -hmm. Are, are actually starting to excel. And because they had four, five, six, or eight weeks prior experience, when they go into initial military training, they've got a heads up on their, on their peers who may be coming in with much 
higher SAT scores, if you will, or better physical fitness, because they kind of know the deal already. And for some of you that have been at West Point, we had West, West Point um, Prepsters. There's a West Point Prep School. And a lot of those young men and women would come into West Point, not able to get on the first look. But after going to prep school, they excelled because they, you know, unlike me, they know how to do left, right bases and do all that stuff when they came in. And we're starting to see this in the in initial military training. I, I, I'm a believer in it. And I, I think in the future, we may be able to um, try out, give people an opportunity to see how they do. You know, they come in and quite frankly, it may be a way to, to save on an investment. We spent a lot of money to get someone into initial military training. But this way they can come in and hey, it's just not for me. Just appreciate that. You know, you try it out, go home, come back and, and, and they have a good experience and they're probably a better person for the couple of weeks they did. So I think we're gonna have to do this if we don't wanna lower standards. We're gonna have to invest in young men and women. And you know, what we wanna do in the army is we want to give people an opportunity to do great things. In fact, we want them to be all they can be. You may be seeing that coming to a station pretty soon. Now that's a catchy phrase. And, and yeah. It's uh, yeah. got some potential. Well, Chief, that's a great rundown. Let me open it up for questions. Uh, and if you've got a question, just raise your hand. We'll get a microphone over to you. Good Watch morning, sir. CB3, Dan Bish, Army Guard. Good to yeah. see you again, sir. Good to see you. So uh, this is probably more of a State Department or an administration question, but just, Good, I won't take it then. No, go ahead. This question for your, <laughs> so, your talk, sir. <clears throat> so I see uh, early December, uh, China went to go visit Saudi Arabia. And uh, I've been kind of keeping tabs on the BRICS nations, uh, Brazil, India, China, Russia, South Africa. Uh, their combined efforts to, one, uh, thinking left of conflict, how we use fiscal policy to help shape the narrative before Lisco, if it were to happen. Uh, what would happen if we were to, if we were to lose our global reserve currency status, and if oil decided to, if oil was then globally priced in say yuan instead of dollars? I, I see this as a left of conflict problem in shaping a bigger narrative across the globe. Um, I hope that you have some guidance for me, sir, to be like, no, it's going to be okay. But this concerns me, sir. Just a thought. <laughs> Yeah, I, that's a great question for somebody else, but I'll take part of it um, because, you know, I, I'd like to, you know, stay where at least that I have a little expertise. But, and, but I, I think the, the point is well taken. And, and I would say that when you look at, um, you know, levers of power that people have, uh, we certainly want to deter or prevent any type of conflict before it happens. And, you know, we, we like, you know, the Army, we always like to have acronyms. We have a little acronym called DIME, it's diplomacy, it's information, it's military and economic. And we like to keep the M as small as we can. People like to keep it big. And so, you know, when you take a look at economic policy, I will leave that to um, much more um, you know, kind of you know, qualified people to discuss that. But, but here's what I would say, and it gets back to what I'm learning is, you know, People need to understand this. There, there should be costs when when you start conflicts. It should be something that we just shouldn't let happen. And the costs are, you know, in reputation as a country. The costs are in how your allies and partners look at you and you bring together. There's economic costs. You know, the difference between you know countries and fighting violent extremists is you have a zip code and, and even if these are autocratic countries, you have to lead that country and you have to lead those people. And, and most people want what everyone else wants is they want a good life, they want jobs, they want to raise their families and do those type of things. So what I would say is, you know, all those come together and you know, that's where integrated deterrence, a term in the national defense strategy kind of falls in. But our role in the military is to make sure that we have trained and ready, ready units. And, you know, we do a lot of things uh, in the Army, uh, a lot of great things. Our National Guard, we do things at home. We respond to national disasters. Heck, we have people, you know, uh, driving buses. I mean, we, we do anything with COVID that we have to. But the one thing we should never forget that we exist to do is fight and win the nation's wars as part of a joint team. And we have to do that. And we're going to do it with allies and partners. And that's why all the activities that we do are extremely important. You know, the strong relationships that we have in Europe over many, many years, you know, the logistics infrastructure, the way the theater is set is all playing out 
uh, in Europe right now. And as we look at other regions around the world, we, we, we need to grade ourselves. Would we be able to respond the same way? Would we have the uh, pre-positioned stocks that allow us to do uh, what we did? You know, would we be able to get an armored brigade combat team on the range uh, in seven days from Fort Stewart? We have to kind of think through how we did that and make sure we understand how we did that but they all play in. So I would take that to an expert on economics. And Mike Meese, my West Point classmate, is here. He, is. he taught SOCH at West yep. Point, his head of the department, and he can, he can give you a good answer. Mike, thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, Dan Shear from Inside Defense. Um, I wanted to ask you about, um, recently, uh, Navy Secretary Del Toro had expressed a little bit of concern about uh, supply chain issues in the defense industrial base with respect to Ukraine and supplying weapons to Ukraine. And he seemed to feel like it might pose some challenges. And I just wanted to know if you agreed, if you felt like some of those supply chain issues would maybe present some challenges in terms of uh, being able to help arm Ukraine. Yeah, first of all, we have the world's greatest Navy and I have tremendous respect for uh, the Secretary of the Navy. I, I think everyone is is taking a look at supply chains. I know we have a lot of industry partners out here. And uh, I think, um, you know, one of the things that I, I, I don't even like the word chain, you know, because we use chain a lot. So we say supply chain, or we say kill chain. Um, I like networks and fabrics as a different way of thinking about it. And what I mean by that is change, you're only as good as the weakest link. So if you're building a, 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 a major weapon system, and, and I would argue that our industry is the most sophisticated, you know, when it comes to weapon systems, but you have a, a piece of that weapon system, even if it's lower scale and we don't make it here, then you, you may not be able to make that system. We found that out with, you know, mass for, for COVID. We, you know, our, I believe our American industry can do anything it wants to do, but many have optimized where they do things based on, you know, the best for, you know, for fiscal reasons. So when it comes to supply chains, is I, I think we all need to take a hard look at, you know, how we do business. I think that, you know, as we provide supplies and ammunition and weapon systems, um, you know, we're making sure that we replenish them. We, we need to. Or also, um, you know, what we're doing in the Army with the approval of Congress is we don't want to buy new old stuff, if that makes sense. What I mean by that, is you know if if we um, give M one one threes armored person personnel carriers, and we're going to replace them, you know, with the approval of Congress, what we want to do is replace them with EMPs, the armored multi purpose vehicles. So we're we're actually improving the readiness of the Army rather than buying, you know. Or, or replenishing with old type things. And that's the philosophy. It's not exactly, you know, I mean, it, there is cost associated with that, but that is, you know, the intent of what we're trying to do when it comes to those systems. So we are concerned about that. We watch that. Every decision that's made on what we're going to give is we take a look at the impact on the readiness and how we're going to replenish those systems. And that's what we've been doing. <clears throat> Sir, good morning. Doug Morrison, great to see the D2 group here. I got Mike sitting, the D2 dogs, and, I, and you never haze me, I know, so uh, appreciate that. Probably should have. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> yes, sir, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll see how your I'd question like, goes. Go ahead. <laughs> sir, I'd like to pull on the thread on the recruiting piece yeah. a little bit. Um, start off with a personal experience. Uh, oldest daughter's a teacher. Um, lots of third rails there. I won't, won't go down that road. Uh, middle daughter's a nurse, Fairfax and Nova. Uh, lots of stresses uh, after COVID. She was on a COVID ward for uh, six months. Um, when you talk about the recruiting challenges, we see the level of casualties in Ukraine right now in large scale uh, combat operations and the resiliency that our force is gonna need. Do you think it's time for uh, I'll call it Abrams too. He implemented 50 years ago, General Abrams, the, the volunteer force. Is it time for a national commission on national service so that it's not just, as you said, it's not just the military service, but teachers uh, to make sure our, our young folks are educated properly. It's, it's in the healthcare profession, those sorts of things. Is it time for a national commission on national service? Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I don't know if it's time for commission, but I, I think it is time, and the secretary I have written about that is, I think it is time for a call to service. Um, I, I think when we take a look at our institutions that you know make this the world's greatest country, I don't think we should take them for granted. I don't think we should take teachers for granted. I don't think we should take police officers for granted, fire you know, men and women for granted. I think all the, you know, the <clears throat> kind of components, uh, we need young men and women to go into those, those fields. And, you know, the interesting on the, on the military side is 83% of the young men and women that come into uh, the military come from uh, military family members. And so, you know, and, you know, I, I, when I was a G, when I signed up all my kids, because we go help, you know, so they're, they're all in. You know, I got a son-in-law, you know, so I've, I've got, I'm, I'm all in, you know. But, but having said that, um, and, and a lot of you are too, and I know, you know, a lot of you have sons and daughters that serve or, in, or, or are serving just like yours. So, you know, a lot of military uh, parents have, you know, kids to decide to go into some type of service, and I, and I think that's but, but we really need to make it, you know, not, not a military family business, but an American family business. And it's really important. And I think what you find is, you know, once people get in, um, you know, they, they go, wow, this is pretty, it's not for everybody, but we, 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 we need that help. And, you know, as I talk to soldiers for life and I, I ask them, hey, help us inspire other, other young men and women to serve, not necessarily in the army, but we really need to do that because someone, you know, this is a dangerous time. You know, we could go into, you know, the strategic environment and you can look around and you start naming multiple countries uh, that we have concerns about. Edmund's, you know, read the National Defense Strategy. You know, this could be a very dangerous time and unimaginable things can happen like in Europe. And so, you know, we need to, to, to be ready. And, and, and the mechanism to do that is, is something I would love to see people come together around and would be very interested in my left next life in supporting those, those type of things. But I, I do think We've got to kind of work our way through it. I mean, the, the nation has come through a very challenging time. You know, just COVID alone, just COVID alone, you know, when was the last time we had a million plus people uh, die of, you know, almost going back to World War II, you know, during the war, but even then the casualties weren't at that rate. And then you put it all together, um, you know, so we, we just need to come out of this strong. We need to, um, you know, get people, you know, to come together around a common cause, and I think that would be helpful. Uh, Tom Spore, Heritage yeah. Foundation. Um, there's a school of thought in Washington, D.C., at least there has been, that uh, at the end of the Russian-Ukraine war, Russia's gonna be irrelevant. They're just gonna be crushed, and we don't need to worry about them. And it seems that uh, Vladimir Putin didn't get that message because Yesterday or the day before, he announced that he's going to grow the size of his army by 30%, up to 1.5 million soldiers. And I think we lose sight of the fact that in a dictatorship or an autocracy, they can do whatever they want. They can grow the size of their army, and they don't really care about what happens to their GDP or all those other kinds of things. And you contrast that with what's going on with our army, where we will shrink this year from an end strength authorized of 480 something to I think 452 active duty. And you can't help but wonder what's happening. And I'd be interested, Chief, in your thoughts on the risk that to our army by going to an end strength of 452. I'd also be interested in uh, whether you sense that, uh, I know this is a delicate area, whether you sense that the rest of the Pentagon is as worried as we are about the size of the army. Yeah, well, first of all, you know, the, the reason that we are stressing, and this is Secretary and myself, um, the importance of retention and, and recruiting is because that, that is what is driving the end strength number. End strength is a function of recruiting and retention. And, you know, I'm on record multiple times. I think we do need a bigger army. And, you know, I, I think um, that you know, when you're, when you're in, you know, the business that we are in, um, you know, we go, you know, people, it's been said that you, you go to war with the army you have. That was said, right? I, I say we go to war with the army we have. And there is a difference. And, you know, and, and what I mean by that, so we want to have the best army we can have, you know, the best army, you know, and, and when I get asked questions um, on, on the army, you know, and do you agree with this? Do you agree with that? Do you have this? What, what I say is we're going to give you the best time we, we can with the resources we get. 
And so when I look at the end strength, I would like more people. You know, when I look at everything, I would like more of this, but, but we're gonna have a budget and we're gonna have authorizations, we're gonna have appropriations. And then what we try to do is say, hey, what's the best we could do with what we have? And make sure that we send no soldier into harm's way that's not ready to go. And, and so, you know, what we're trying to do is we've got great guard and reserve, we got active, and we're trying to do the best we can with what we have. But the issue right now on end strength, from, you know, again, what I've been told from both on, on, in the building and over uh, on the hill, and there's people from the hill, they can correct me if I'm wrong, is the end strength right now is a function of our ability to re recruit and retain. No one is driving us saying that you have to have that. In fact, you know, I'm not gonna spot out Jenny, but Jen, Jenny's here, but you know, she could ask, but th that is what's driving it. What we need help with is inspiring young men and women to serve. That's where I need help. I, you know, people want to help me a whole a lot of other places. Just tell me everything else. I, I appreciate all that help. But if you really want to help the army, if you're out there, you know, um, I feel very comfortable where the army is. What I need is young men and women to answer the call to service. And what I don't want to do, and we've, we've held out, is I don't want to lower standards because it may make us feel good right now, but in the long term you know, the, the brand of the Army will be lessened. So, you know, for all those that are out there writing and talking, you know, if you want to help the United States Army, inspire young men and women to serve. Because quite frankly, I, I do believe in they can be all they can be. I know that's a, that's a line, and I can talk a little about that. We are bringing that back, and we're rolling those type things out. But, you know, I, 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 you, know you hear a lot of soldier stories. And, you know, and we all have stories, you know, where I was 16 years old in Quincy working for the Quincy sewage department, shoveling things that, you know, many would not be proud of. And, you know, an older gentleman said, hey, Jim, you don't want to be doing this when you're 45 years old. He was, I didn't want to be doing it when I was 16 years old, <laughs> but, but he goes, go to school, you know? And, you know, for young men and women uh, that want to have an opportunity for a great future, whether you do three, four, five, or 42 years, I don't think there's any better place to go. And no matter where you come from, no one can take that away from you. And we need to get that out because a lot of people read the news so they see what's being said and with this, with that. You know, we have a little of everything. We're not, we are not a perfect organization, but we are the world's greatest army. We are the world, and we need to kind of remember that sometimes. And we need to get young men and women to say, hey, come in the army. You know, I, I, I used to, I got, got uh, Gonna get me going here, but I, you know, I had the privilege of command the 101st Airborne Division, and I got a chance to spend a lot of time with a band of brothers, the you know, the people that are actually in the movie, the Babe, and all those folks, and you know, Vinny Sparans and all these type of things. But when you look at those th those men, and most of them served two years in the army, but for them, it was the most important thing besides their wife and kids that they did in their life. And what we want to do is give people that opportunity. You know, my, my dad was a uh, second class petty officer in the Navy. He served on an LST, which in, in for those, I'm not much, in, if there's any Navy folks, that's considered like a rust bucket, not really, you know, whatever. But you would have thought that, you know, during the Korean War that, you know, besides his wife and kids, that was the most important thing he did in his life. And we want to give people that opportunity. And I think sometimes, because there's so much noise going on, people just aren't going to serve. And we have to compete for their talent. We have to take care of them. And then, you know, and then send them off. If they only want to serve three years, send them off. Go, thank you. You're a soldier for life. I'm giving your mission two things. You inspire young men and women to serve, and you hire vets. You hire our vets. And that's the ecosystem that we need to have in this country. And everyone else that's out, you, you, can, you can take shots at us. You can do whatever you want, and we can take the bad news. But at the end of the day, we need to protect this nation. You know, and I would argue, you know, as long as we have criminals, we're going to need police, police forces. As long as we have people that are ill, we're going to need doctors and lawyers. And as long as we had adversaries, we're going to need a military that can do that stuff. And that's, you know, allows us to do this. So my two cents. Thank you for the question. Yes. There we go. Now I'm on. General, good to see you. John Judson with Defense News. Um, you had mentioned regarding your tri recent trip to Europe that allies and partners have the money now more to invest in defense, but 
asked if the industrial base is ready for that. Um, do they have what they need to do? And I'm wondering if you could answer that question based on what you're seeing. Um, you know, what are some of the challenges that you witnessed uh, on that trip in terms of industrial base readiness there? Um, and are there opportunities for collaboration? And I think that maybe that's already begun. I think maybe with 155 munitions or something, uh, there's some collaboration going on with various European countries. But um, if you could talk a little bit more about what you're seeing there. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I did mention, I think um, many of the ground forces uh, are looking to uh, in, improve their force. And, and there's always that discussion about, um, you know, how much ground forces need or you don't need. And, and I think what happens is we, we always learn the same lessons over and over again that you, you, you know, if you're going to be decisive, you need a ground force that, that can do what it needs to do. And, you know, at the same time, you don't want to buy insurance if you don't need it, or you don't want to invest in systems if you don't think you need it. But, you know, right now we know we, we need these capabilities. Um, and, you know, you have a lot of industry here and industry is going to invest uh, in, in, in areas that they think there's going to be return on investment. So, you know, many of these systems is going to have to be, a, you know, a, a long range investment. If, if, you know, there was a question asked, I think Tom asked about, hey, this, this thing is going to be over in a year or, or two years. Um, the announcements I've seen is, and maybe I, you know, I live in an environment where we plan for the worst. We, you know, we can hope for the best, but, you know, again, we go to war with the army we have. Um, Russia's is not done. They, they, they say they're not. They're going to build their army, and, and when they say 1.5 million, are they going to grow it? They're talking 2026. So this thing is not over for the next couple of years. And so you know, if you're sitting in Europe, you're sitting someplace else, and you're concerned, con you're concerned about your security, you're going to have to invest in your defense. You're going to have to buy insurance, and then you're going to have to um, for industry. You know, to show them that you're willing to pay for those systems and get things on contracts and long term contracts. And and again, you know, I, I think industry will respond. You got a lot of industry here can ask them. But, you know, my sense is if they see um, uh, resources being put in, investments being made and con contracts being signed, uh, they're going to get after that. So that's what I'm seeing. And, and you know, again, in, in Europe, you know, and many of those countries are going to want to um, invest in their organic industrial base. And in and, and, and some of those countries, they're a lot further behind because they just haven't done it for 10, 15 years. And, and there's lessons to be learned for that. You know, I, I look at uh, we may need to do things differently in the future. You know, if, if it takes, you know, two years to build, you know, a, a certain missile, if it say it takes two years, um, and we think we need a thousand of those uh, systems. We need to take a look at how they're built, and it may be there's you know three or four long lead items, and we can't afford to buy the whole system, but we can afford to buy the long lead items. So the fact we have those long lead items, we actually reduce the resupply to three months rather than two years. You know, they're sitting on the shelf. We don't it, you know, and we have the ability. So we'd have to start to think about. You know, how do you, uh, in a non-linear way, uh, buy insurance so when something happens, when you have the money, you can reduce the amount of time to stand up your organic industrial base or to start producing at the level you need to do. And, you know, in, in some ways, we're, we may have to invest money uh, to, to buy that capability, knowing that we don't necessarily need it right now, but if something happens, and you know, all of a sudden we see the expenditure of maybe a million uh, 155 rounds, which we haven't seen in, in, in a long time, we can quickly you know, build that up. So I think we have to look at the supply network, not necessarily the chain and our fabric and, and, and think differently about how we get the results outcomes that we need. And, and, and it's probably not doing it in, in a linear industrial way that we've done in the past. Take, a, take advantage of information technology. How about join me in a round of applause for the Chief of Staff for that great rundown. <laughs> so we've got a couple more coffee series in February, 8 February, Jim Rainey from Army Futures Command will be here. You don't want to miss that. 20, I'm sorry, 14 February. 
Sergeant Major of the Army Grinston will be here, and uh, what a great way to start Valentine's Day, right? Get motivated. 23 February is an aviation hot topic that we've really been waiting for. I'm really looking forward to that on 23 February. And then uh, 28 to 30 March, we're back in Huntsville. It's been a couple of years away. Global Force, uh, and it's already sold out. It's going to be a great event down in Huntsville, 28 to 30 March. I'm just uh, those of you who are members, thank you for being members. But as the chief was talking about, you know, we need help inspiring folks to serve. I think there's no better way to do that than join your association, the United States Army, educate, inform, and connect America is what we do about the Army. Inspire folks. 122 chapters across the country. It's a great way to do it. So if you're not a member, join the team. And if you are a member, thanks for being a member. And that's a great way to get at uh, what this country needs and inspiring folks. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great Army day. All right.